Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's FHFA's listening session on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's equitable housing finance plans. I'm Denise Lorenzen with the Office of Fair Lending Oversight, and I'll be facilitating today's session. As a quick reminder, this is being recorded and will be posted on the FHFA website and YouTube channel. I will now pass it along to Nawa Tago, Deputy Director for Division of Housing Mission and Goals, who will provide opening remarks. Nawa. Thank you, Denise, and good afternoon to all of you. I want to add my voice to Denise to thank you again for joining us for today's FHFA's listening session on the Enterprises Equitable Housing Finance Plan updates, their recently published performance reports, and the upcoming plans for 2025 to 2027. As you know, the objective of our listening session is for FHFA to get feedback from interested stakeholders. We really value your input and we will consider it seriously as we move forward. During today's listening session, we have the opportunity to both reflect on the progress and achievements of the enterprise's equitable housing finance plans, which were put in place just a couple of years ago, but also to look ahead to new and emerging opportunities to drive further impact. These plans have helped start an important conversation on how to ensure all families have access to affordable and sustainable housing opportunities, but there is still much work ahead. Now, developed by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, the plans serve as vital frameworks to identify and assess persisting barriers to housing access nationwide for both renters and aspiring homeowners. Reflecting on 2023 alone reveals the significant impact these plans have had by providing tangible support and resources to over 1.8 million consumers. This impact transcends geographical and racial boundaries, reaching individuals across the nation from cities to rural areas. For example, the enterprise's positive rent payment programs have aided over 900,000 renters in establishing credit. And over the past two years, their special purpose credit programs have empowered more than 17,000 families to secure mortgages and begin to, bu to build familial wealth. Now, looking ahead at the 2024 plan updates, highlights Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's continued efforts to address housing accessibility issues. The enterprises, their shared commitments to initiatives like developing a first generation home buyer definition and enhancing social bond programs are just two examples. Now, we're particularly interested in your feedback on the first generation home buyer definition and how the use of this definition should be deployed in future offerings. With the conclusion of the current plan cycle, we're also looking forward for feedback on the upcoming plans for 2025 through 2027. FHFA is seeking public input on what's been working, as well as what should be changed and what new initiatives should be considered. And with that, I thank you for your time, your attention, and your feedback, and we look forward to listening. Thank you. Thanks, Nawa. Um, so before we move on to the presenters, a few housekeeping rules um, or housekeeping items. Notably, all feedback offered in today's session should be directed to FHFA rather than to any other participant. And while this listening session does not constitute an advisory group, we may still summarize themes from the feedback gathered today. Nothing said in this meeting should be construed as binding or final decision by the FHFA director or FHFA staff. Any questions we have are here are focused on understanding your views and do not indicate a position of FHFA staff or the agency. Now each speaker will have seven minutes to speak and when there's one minute remaining, I will let you know. So I will now pass it on to our first speaker, Andrew Jakobovic from Enterprise Community Partners, followed by Garth Raymond from National Council of State Housing Agency. Andrew. Thank you, Denise. Um, <clears throat> so I wanna open my remarks by thanking Denise uh, and the staff at FHFA for the opportunity to provide input into the equitable housing finance plan process. And my remarks are mostly gonna be forward looking uh, rather than commenting specifically on the performance in the 2022 through 2024 plan series. Um, so. Uh, for those who do not know me, my name is Andrew Jakovic. I'm the Vice President for Policy Development and Research at Enterprise Community Partners. Uh, Enterprise is a national nonprofit that exists to make a good home possible for the millions of families without one. We support community development organizations on the ground, we aggregate and invest capital for impact, and we advance housing policy at every level of government 
and build and manage communities ourselves, mostly in the mid-Atlantic area. Over the last 42 years, we have invested $72 billion, and we recently celebrated the creation of our one millionth home uh, here in Maryland, working across all 50 states, the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands, all with the goal of making home and community places of pride, power, and belonging. But also note that Enterprise is proudly a member of the Underserved Mortgage Markets Coalition, which is a collection of 35 affordable housing organizations working collectively to expand mortgage financing to groups traditionally underserved in the market. Uh, additionally, in the interest of transparency, I want to also recognize our multifaceted relationships with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, including collaborating uh, on certain aspects of duty to serve and equitable housing finance plan activities. Uh, and Bellwether Enterprise, in which we have an ownership stake, is a Fannie Mae delegated underwriting and servicing lender, a dust lender, multifamily affordable housing lender, Freddie Mac program plus seller servicer and targeted affordable housing lender. So we sort of see end to end across the entire spectrum uh, of the housing finance system that is regulated by FHFA. And that I think gives us certain insights into where the needs are, what works well, uh, and hopefully that's valuable in this context. Uh, in the context of the equitable housing finance plans themselves, we know that for too long, the levers of policy and programs were used to create and perpetuate inequity along racial and ethnic lines. And so in the context of housing and the housing finance system, it's entirely appropriate that the system and those who participate in it be asked to critically evaluate the inequities and bring the full capacity of the system to bear to make the outcomes more equitable. I'm also pleased to be joined on the roster of speakers today by many of our partners. And I know there are many important activities that can and should be incorporated in the enterprise's equitable housing finance plans and look forward to hearing from those speakers on those topics as well. I'm gonna use my time to highlight the needs of renters specifically and to elevate consideration of equitable housing finance plan activities that expand Native American access to quality affordable homes for rent and for ownership in a range of forms. In terms of equitable access to rental housing, identifying and addressing barriers to sustainable housing opportunities for underserved communities requires considering the needs of renters as renters and not only as future home buyers. Differences in renter cost burdens by race and ethnicity have long persisted. The post-pandemic rates of severe cost burden have remained noticeably elevated compared to non-Hispanic white renters, with the increase among non-Hispanic black renters outpacing the increase seen among non-Hispanic white renters, also beginning from a much higher pre-pandemic baseline. The same analysis of census data that finds those facts also shows that among the top 10 states with the largest increases in cost burden, or sorry, in share of severely cost burden renters between 2017 and 2022, all but two of those 10 states had median monthly rents in 2022 below the national median, uh, which was only $1,250 a month. So uh, the need is pervasive um, and it applies across all states in the country. It's not simply a high cost market problem. Plan activities to support renters therefore should include actions designed to make it easier for renters to access homes, remain stably housed and strengthen their financial well-being. The GSE's current plan activities related to voucher acceptance, tenant protections, rent reporting and financial coaching, and security deposit alternatives would all fall under this umbrella and we encourage those to be expanded. At the same time, however, the dearth of affordable supply remains a significant problem and the GSEs must play a more expansive role in delivering liquidity to emerging developers of color, many of whom work in communities with significant cost burdens, and for the production and preservation of affordable rental housing that serves those underserved communities. I would also highlight the opportunity for the GSEs to contribute to addressing the challenges that affordable multifamily owners and operators are facing from rising insurance costs. The challenges are particularly acute for owners with smaller balance sheets, including BIPOC owners. Similarly, addressing systemic inequities in housing and energy costs requires intentional policies and practices and the financing necessary to make the improvements to lower those costs. Several initiatives that address supply in the current plan saw goals scaled back or limited to ongoing research. The next round of plans should address the barriers to adoption and scalability or propose new approaches if current activities were deemed unworkable, and they should commit to bringing products to market based on the research findings. Shifting gears to the expanding Native American access to affordability, accessibility, and availability of homes um, is critical. They're a population that faces extensive housing-related challenges both on and off trust lands. And the EHF plan development process calls for public engagement and outreach. And I'd, I'd note that this matter is particularly important given, and I'm now quoting the Memorandum on Uniform Standards for Tribal Consultation uh, that was released a number of years ago based on a much older executive order, that the United States also has a unique trust relationship with 
and responsibility to protect and support tribal nations. And so with that in mind, given the degree to which the legal status of tribal trust land on reservations poses such dramatic challenges to home financing, purchase and development, Enterprise believes that there must be special attention paid to trust land. Without geographic targeting, funding from programs will likely flow where it is easiest to use. Uh, one aspect of this is evidence from the fact that fewer than 15% of HUD 184 loans are made on trust land annually, despite the program's original intent to strengthen home ownership in Indian country. The GSEs should further build out their legal infrastructure, including leases, mortgage code, and MOUs for conventional mortgages between the GSEs and the tribes. EHF plan activities should focus on down payment assistance, grant support, partnerships with native CDFIs and other eligible nonprofits to facilitate asset development, home improvements, and other hard housing costs for tribal citizens by supporting the creation of loan capital pools that allow for deep subsidies. We also encourage improved financing tools for needed infrastructure that supports housing development, as well as capacity building opportunities for budding for profit, nonprofit, and tribally based native developers, as well as organizations seeking to develop housing in their communities. For all of these activities, as well as any of the other activities engaged in under the equitable housing finance plans, timely public reporting of goal performance and ongoing stakeholder engagement to allow for real-time adjustments to products and policies are absolutely essential for the success of the program, as well as the benefits that must accrue to the individuals who are impacted. In closing, Andrew, I want to thank you again for affording me the opportunity for sharing these thoughts, and I look forward to continuing to engage with the FHFA staff and the staff of the enterprises and our partners as they develop new plans. Thank you, Denise. Thank you, Andrew. And I will now pass it on to Garth Freeman and followed by Maureen Yap from National Fair Housing Alliance. And Garth. Hello. Thank you. On behalf of the nation's state housing finance agencies, the National Council of State Housing Agencies, thanks FHFA for the opportunity to speak to you today regarding Fannie Mae's and Freddie Mac's equitable housing finance plans. NCSHA is also a member of the Underserved Mortgage Markets Coalition, which has a particular interest in this and other FHFA and GSE affordable housing initiatives. NCSHA thanks FHFA for its continued focus on establishing an equitable housing finance market and for recently acting to codify the equitable housing finance plans into federal regulations. The plans have helped spur Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to take substantive steps toward addressing inequities in our nation's housing markets and confronting the longstanding, persistent, and deep disparities in affordable housing access based on color, income, and other factors. We applaud FHFA and the GSEs for their actions to date designed to overcome these inequities and disparities. HFAs are national partners for these endeavors as they are at the center of the nation's affordable housing system. Their programs focus on meeting the needs of low and moderate income home buyers and renters in their states. HFAs have partnered with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to extend billions of dollars of credit to tens of thousands of home buyers over the past several years and developers of rental housing. The median borrower income for all HFA program loans in 2022 was $59,427, 80% of the national median income. 38% of HFA program loans went to people of color and 39% to female-headed households. HFAs have been and continue to be well-positioned to work with FHFA and the GSEs to promote a more equitable housing finance system. Generally, we believe the GSEs can and should continue to examine and push loan underwriting criteria, support HFAs and others, first generation, and special purpose or special purpose-like credit programs, and find new ways to assess risk to qualify more non-traditional but purchase-ready borrowers. We encourage the GSEs to establish permanent and large-scale programs, as well as targeted and niche products and activities to promote a more equitable housing finance system. The GSEs must also, however, 
stay focused on their standard or traditional HFA and other affordable housing products and their affordable housing goals and duty to serve priorities, many of which also support more equitable housing finance. For today's remarks, I will focus on two specific suggestions, fully restoring the pricing advantage for the GSE's HFA products and facilitating acquisition, development, and construction financing through HFAs. For years, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have offered special HFA-only products with discounted pricing and other borrower benefits. Unfortunately, in 2019, to comply with FHFA's capital requirements, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac eliminated the pricing advantage for their HFA products for all loans to borrowers above 80% of area median income. They also increased private mortgage insurance coverage requirements. Thankfully, in late 2022, FHFA directed the GSEs to waive LLPAs for a variety of affordable mortgage products, including all HFA-only product loans, restoring much of the pricing advantage. We ask FHFA now to waive the increased PMI coverage requirements for all HFA-only product loans, so HFA borrowers would be eligible to take out charter-level coverage. This would reduce mortgage insurance costs and improve affordability. Regarding AD&C financing, the shortage of affordable for-sale homes has been well-documented and particularly affects many of the people that equitable housing finance plans focus on. A decade ago, roughly 20% of HFA financed home buyers purchased a new home. In 2022, only 7% did. This is just one more indicator of the worsening shortage of entry-level homes. Many HFAs are piloting innovative efforts, but HFAs cannot provide the large-scale national-level support that is needed to truly address this issue. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac can. We suggest HFAs and the GSEs work together to pilot AD&C loans for affordable for-sale homes, and FHA facilitates that partnership. Lastly, I would like to respond to FHFA's question regarding the definition of first-generation home buyer recently published by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. While the definition is generally sound, we feel there are a few ways it can be improved. Most importantly, we ask FHFA and the GSEs to clarify and work to make it understood widely that the definition is not binding on HFA and other state and local programs targeted to first-generation home buyers that may use a different definition. Several HFAs have One in minute. recent years established first-generation home buyer programs with the definitions all or in part set by their state legislatures. If the GSEs or their lenders hold strictly to the GSE definition, loans made under some of these programs might not be eligible for Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac purchase or securitization unless those states were to change their statutory definitions of potentially tall order. In addition, we also ask that the GSEs consider modifying the underlying definition of first-time homebuyer to include those who previously lost their homes to foreclosure or other adverse circumstances, but who otherwise meet the definition. Also, for couples, consider making the no ownership interest qualification apply only to one of the borrowers rather than both. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you, Garth. And now, Maureen, followed by Emerson McQuantic from National Community Debt Stabilization Trust. Thank you, Denise. And thank you to FHFA for hosting this important listening session. My name is Maureen Yap, and I'm the VP of Public Policy and Senior Counsel for Fair Lending at the National Fair Housing Alliance. Next slide, please. The National Fair Housing Alliance leads the fair housing movement and works to ensure equitable housing opportunities for all people and communities. Next slide, please. Overall, the National Fair Housing Alliance applauds FHFA for codifying the requirement for equitable housing finance plans or equity plans 
in regulation and commends the GSEs for their dedication to supporting fair and affordable housing. To begin with, the GSE's equity plans appropriately focus on programs for Black and Latino mortgage applicants based on statutory requirements, regulatory requirements, and the extent of the need in communities of color. With respect to the need, the Black, White, and Latino White home ownership gap remains wide and persistent. In 2021, the Black, White home ownership gap stood at 29 percentage points which was wider than it was when race-based discrimination against home buyers was legal prior to the passage of the Fair Housing Act in 1968. Similarly, the Latino white gap is currently at about 22 percentage points. Even when the home ownership rate is stratified by household income, there continues to be significant disparities in racial and ethnic home ownership rates. By every measure and regardless of income, the barriers to home ownership are more challenging for Black and Latino mortgage applicants, including the rent burden, wealth transfer, down payment, underwriting, pricing, and appraisals. Next slide, please. Because of America's long history of discriminatory housing policies, and because income-driven programs have not closed the home ownership gap, race-conscious programs are needed to create an equitable housing market. The Equal Credit Opportunity Act and Regulation B have long contained a provision that allows lenders to offer race-conscious special purpose credit programs, or SPCPs, but lenders have been reluctant to do so without assurances of mortgage market liquidity. The GSEs have made substantial strides in developing programs to buy lender SPCPs or deploy their own SBCPs. The GSC should continue to expand liquidity for special purpose credit programs. In addition, our key recommendation is that the GSEs move quickly to adopt a robust definition of first generation home buyer and then prioritize support for first generation home buyers in products and programs. With respect to the definition, we fully support the proposal with some minor tweaks. We recommend using a simple verification process, ensuring that domestic partners and spouses are not also required to meet the definition, and adding borrowers whose parents lost a home to foreclosure during the last three years. After finalizing the definition, the GSC should expand liquidity for these first-generation homebuyer loans as quickly as possible. Next slide, please. Next, the GSC should ensure that other aspects of the home buying process are fair and non-discriminatory. First, given the important role that appraisals play in determining access to home ownership, home equity, and wealth, the GSC should number one continue exploring anti-bias enhancements to the Uniform Residential Appraisal Report, such as real-time risk flags. Number two, support FHFA's release of property-level appraisal data to the public. And number three, support robust public research using the Uniform Appraisal Data Set. Second, the GSC should create programs to provide liquidity for small dollar mortgage loans, as borrowers of color are more likely to need these loans. Third, the GSC should amend their equity plans to specifically ensure that any artificial intelligence that will materially impact the borrower is fully vetted for potential discriminatory bias and less discriminatory alternatives. Fourth, the GSC should implement non-discriminatory servicing and REO maintenance and marketing policies. And last, the GSC should support finally eliminating all loan level price adjustments because they unjustifiably increase mortgage costs and have a disparate impact on borrowers of color. Next slide, please. Finally, we turn to implementation. We support FHFA's final rule and emphasize that FHFA and the GSCs should engage in comprehensive consultations with fair housing, civil rights, and consumer advocates, 
and develop transparent and meaningful metrics to evaluate the equity plan performance. Next slide, please. Last, to the FHFA and GSE teams, thank you for your efforts and the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. So next we have Emerson McClintock and then followed by John Wong from Asian Real Estates Association of America. Emerson. Good afternoon and thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Emerson McClintock and I work as a policy analyst for the National Community Stabilization Trust, um, otherwise known as NCST. Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with us, NCST is a national nonprofit that works to increase home ownership by expanding the supply of affordable single family homes to stabilize neighborhoods, build community wealth, and advance racial equity. To help ensure that our policy recommendations are rooted in the practitioner perspective, we also manage a nonprofit led advocacy coalition called the Homeownership Alliance. The Homeownership Alliance is a practitioner-led coalition of 20 CDFIs and nonprofit housing developers serving 16 states. As members of the Underserved Mortgage Markets Coalition, both NCST and the Homeownership Alliance seek to advance racial equity by strengthening neighborhoods of color and promoting racial equity and homeownership, values which are both central to the enterprise's foundational missions of advancing opportunities for underserved communities within our housing finance system. NCST is extremely appreciative of the steps the FHFA has taken to correct the inequities in our housing finance system through the release of this final rule, and we're very excited to see some of our previous recommendations addressed, which include, but are not limited to, conducting research, evaluating the impact of appraisal standards on borrowers and communities of color, the FHFA's uniform appraisal data set aggregate statistics found that properties located in minority tracts have a higher proportion of appraised values less than the contract price. Conducting robust research like this will help the agency to better understand the underlying discriminatory practices within appraisals and communities of color and help practitioners make well-informed policy recommendations to combat these practices moving forward. We also appreciate FHFA for taking measures to reduce the enterprise's automated underwriting system accept rate gaps by releasing data on Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's underwriting systems. We recognize and appreciate uh, FHFA's efforts to move away from a subjective underwriting system, and we truly believe that the release of these data will allow the enterprises to more effectively analyze which communities are being disproportionately impacted by current practices. And finally, we appreciate the agency reiterating the need for the enterprises to take actions that undo historic patterns of segregation and other types of discrimination to underserved communities. While this rule is a major step forward in addressing issues of equity within our housing finance system, particularly for those people of color and others chronically underserved by the mortgage market, we believe FHFA can take additional steps to further strengthen programming and build on the new rule. As such, we recommend that FHFA should consider the following. One, take measures to further increase transparency with external stakeholders by disclosing performance ratings and developing clear public evaluation metrics. In its RFI, the FHFA asked commenters whether or not an evaluation of the enterprise's equitable housing performance should be publicly issued, and if evaluation metrics should be included in the enterprise's public performance report. NCST was and continues to be extremely supportive of these measures because publicly releasing these reports would dramatically enhance transparency with stakeholders and would also help indicate successes or failures in advancing equitable housing finance. Not only would implementing these changes inform the public of clear progress updates, but it would also allow stakeholders to independently analyze metrics that are either helping or hindering progress and provide subsequent policy recommendations on ways the GSEs can move forward. As such, we urge FHFA to disclose its supervisory ratings to the public, design and implement a public evaluation system with actual concrete ratings, and require that the enterprises report performance on each objective in their respective plans. We even suggest FHFA look to its current duty to serve program as an appropriate reporting model and consider implementing a similar structure for its equitable housing finance plans. Two, the enterprises should note language specificities that may exist among larger populations and evaluate subsequent pathways to reach these communities. 
The final rule included regulatory codification for the enterprises to collect, maintain, and report data on language preference. This is a positive step forward in that it will help support efforts to reach underserved populations that would otherwise struggle to understand information being presented to them in English. However, the Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander community represents over 30 countries, speaks over 100 languages, and has distinct histories, cultures, and circumstances that directly impact their experiences in the U.S. mortgage market. As a result, it is critical that FHFA uphold its commitment to ensuring equal treatment of all renters and homeowners, regardless of race, and disaggregate data to the greatest extent possible to illuminate trends and potential disparities often hidden in aggregate numbers. We do understand that this will take additional time and resources from FHFA and the GSEs, but there are still communities that are facing barriers to the housing finance system because they fall outside of FHFA's current translation offerings, which are limited to Korean, traditional Chinese, Vietnamese, and Tagalog. And finally, the enterprises should reevaluate their distressed property and note sales practices. It is the fundamental belief of both NCST and the Homeownership Alliance that a strong and mission-driven nonprofit delivery system is a vital component to increasing equity in our housing finance system, and the enterprises can and should do more to empower these entities by way of note sales. The GSE's existing note sales practices currently operate to restrict the supply of affordable homes available for owner occupancy, and nonprofits are unable to meaningfully compete with large investors and are often- One minute and are often outbid by these well-capitalized entities. FHFA should look to create a pool of loans only offered for sale to nonprofits and government entities and require that all of these note sales achieve a certain neighborhood positive outcome, like a certain percentage of first-time home buyers or owner occupants. With all that said, we very much appreciate FHFA's commitment and willingness to increase the equity within our housing finance system, and we really do view this final rulemaking as a tremendous step forward. Despite this being a step in the right direction, there is so much work to be done in order for underserved communities to reap the full benefits of our housing finance system, and FHFA and the enterprises can do more to ensure that this program remains robust, effective, and sustainable for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you, Emerson. Now we, um, we will have John, followed by Hypen M, um, after... Uh, Mr. Wong, thank you. Thank you. And I, my name is John Wong. I am a founding chairman of the Asian Real Estate Association of America, commonly known as ARIA. And the association was founded 21 years ago and currently has a network reach of over 18,000 uh, practitioners. The We are very, very pleased to have been to have this opportunity to be at this listening session. Uh, ARIA has had the fortune to be involved in earlier renditions uh, of these listening sessions. And we're grateful to see the changes that are being contemplated for the next plans. Regarding its, the shifts that we see is that in fact, the plan, the equitable uh, housing finance plans are becoming more granular. I think that in the earlier versions, we talked about the great need broadly what we're seeing now as we're moving forward, including definitions of what a first generation home buyer is, is getting to the on the ground work that is needed to in fact um, reach greater equity among housing participants. One of the comments I will make in regarding any plan is that in fact, in the Asian American, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander segment, there is a masking of portions of individuals within this classification that are almost invisible. Uh, there's a general perception that the folks of, from countries of origin in Asia are successful. The census shows a higher income, higher education, and there's a broad perception that, in fact, no assistance is needed. Nothing could be farther than the truth. In the past three years, ARIA has focused greatly on this aggregation to really getting the data uh, regarding the granular needs within the community. And in the last two years, State of Asia America report, an annual document that ARIA puts out uh, highlighting 
different aspects of the segment as it relates to home ownership and housing in general. I will give you some stats from the most current version, uh, which shows that some segments of the Asian community are doing well. Asian Indians currently have a 62.6% home ownership rate with an average, um, an average in, a median income of $175,000. The Chinese at 66.2% at an income of 125,000 average. The Filipinos at 65% at 121,000. And the Vietnamese at 70% at 93,000. I point these out because all four of these groups are, while not doing as well as Americans as a whole regarding homeownership, uh, have had some increases. I think the interesting component is that the income level differs for each one. And in fact, the country of origin, Viet Vietnam, uh, has the highest homeownership percentage, with in fact the lowest income of all these four groups which I point to the fact that we cannot just have generalized um, methodology or general, generalized programs to help folks. We need to understand better uh, what has actually been driving the opportunities and enabling uh, individ individuals and families to become, to move into homeownership. And these are the four groups that are doing well. But if we go more granularly, the Native Hawaiian, pop within the, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander population, we can go through some different, uh, the Native Hawaiians at 57.6% home ownership, Samoans at 34% home ownership, and Tongans at 44% home ownership, and the Fijian population at 46% home ownership. Parallel to what I discussed earlier with the uh, earlier four groups, the Fijians at 46% home ownership have the highest income of the four of the second set of four groups at 85,635. So they have income that would enable homeownership, but there are factors that are causing their homeownership rate to be lower than others. So it is important that as we move forward, that we look at some of the granularity and the, and the differences in populations uh, to see where the help is needed. The model minority myth that all Asians are doing well is not accurate, and it is through understanding in more detail the subgroups within the AA and HBI segment that we'll get data that we need. The other aspect is one of the, the hindrances is actually language access, and ARIA has worked with FHA, FHA to work with the Mortgage uh, Translation Clearinghouse and we're very, very pleased that, you know, four Asian languages, Korean, Tagalog, traditional Chinese, and Vietnamese, are now part of that translate, translation resource. The challenge is that the four groups that I mentioned earlier within the native Hawaiian uh, Pacific Islander group, those four languages may be not the ones that, they, that serves well, and there is still limited English proficiency concerns with these groups. So the question is, how do we expand translations uh, into groups that are now currently invisible with the A and HPI segment? And historically, we have all known that to really translate properly is extremely expensive to do. So as such, I think that the, the world is shifted right now. And with technology, there may be solutions that will help this. Uh, as an example, Google supports 133 different languages, and in fact, can just from their photographs translate 37 different languages. But the challenge is, like anything else when you're using technology, is to make sure that there is accurate translations. Historically, individuals within the AA and HPI segment with limited English uh, proficiency had their young children who were somewhat fluent in English do the translations. There's sort of this sort of, uh, it's not a myth because I know I was one of those individuals who at a very young age had to translate legal documents for my parents. But I think that- uh, 20 seconds. Looking at the technology capabilities, number one, and then making sure uh, that the languages are translated properly would be very important. We applaud the, um, the movement toward having the 
the first generation home buyer, and we have further thoughts on that, which I'll forward to you in writing. Thank you. Thank you, John. So now we have Hi Pen M from Faith and Community Empowerment, if she's on. Thank um, you. Hi, and um, thank you so much for the opportunity again. My name is Hey Pen M. I serve as president. Uh, and CEO of a nonprofit called Faith and Community Empowerment. And we have been in the housing and um, home ownership space since 2002. Um, and so we have trained over 10,000, uh, I'm sorry, 15,000 individuals on home ownership as well as foreclosure prevention and uh, affordable housing. I'm here today to uh, first uh, commend that FHFA is um, shifting to looking at uh, being on need space. Um, I want to say that the first iteration of the equitable housing financing plan um, that was announced by uh, both Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae uh, left out the AAPI community. And as mentioned by uh, John from ARIA, uh, the earlier speaker, that again, the model minority myth for the AAPI community is truly a myth. And when you disaggregate, um, for example, the Korean and black home ownership rate is the same at 42%. And there are seven other API subgroups that are below the black and Korean home ownership rate and 12 API subgroups below the Hispanic home ownership rate of 48%. And so again, I believe that um, FHFA has tremendous influence on um, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, but also the financial institutions. It signals who is priority, who is not. And I believe that the special purpose credit programs, again, it's really up to each financial institution who they choose. Uh, but many of their initiatives, again, continue to uh, consistently leave out the AAPI community. Um, I know that in some studies that uh, for the uh, decline in loans um, is Asians are, uh, have one of the highest rates of decline uh, because of debt to income ratio. And so again, I believe that there is uh, a greater need <laughs> to disaggregate API data and intentionality in looking at um, studies as well as initiatives that will also help boost the home ownership rate of the AAPI community. I also want to second about the language access using AI as a tool. Um, I think that could help. There's a lot of, of a gap between the uh, housing counseling agencies um, that support and reach the AAPI community. A majority, I would say, um, do not provide Asian language access. There's literally probably we could count on one hand, maybe two hands, the number of API serving housing counseling agencies. And I think that translates again to lack of outreach, lack of um, access, um, lack of again, building wealth opportunities. And so I wanna just second that. The third piece is that again, I think there needs to be greater um, awareness about um, how small business income, when you're self-employed, a lot of people try to um, minimize their tax liability, but then when they don't realize that when they purchase a home that their limited recognized income will hurt their ability to buy a home. And so again, some kind of uh, programs that will allow for recognition of affordability of buying a home without necessarily being connected to uh, taxable income rec on their tax return as well. So again, but thank you. I really appreciate the direction that FHFA is going. Uh, again, in terms of looking at shared needs, uh, shared goals um, as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ipen. Um, So now we have Bruce Dorplin from National Housing Resource Center, followed by Christy Finsel from Oklahoma Native Assets Coalition. Bruce? Um, hello, I'm Bruce Dora Palin from the National Housing Resource Center. We work with housing counseling groups all around the country and work also with um, trying to increase uh, opportunities around affordable housing, especially in underserved communities. Uh, we'd like to talk uh, a forward conversation about a critical program that Fannie, and Fred, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are not performing well on. And that is, we know there's a deep commitment to um, increasing Black and Latino homeownership and um, addressing the homeownership gap. 
there's a really creative, valuable program, the Section 8 Home Ownership Voucher, I'm sorry, the Section 8 uh, Housing Choice Voucher Program. And it's um, and it's it's commonly known as a subsidy on rents, so that nobody who, ha who is a Section 8 holder has to pay more than 30% of their income, and the remainder of the rent due is paid by the voucher, by the uh, subsidy from the government. And it's a very valuable program. We certainly need more of them as, as vouchers in general. But um, those same people, um, that voucher subsidy can be applied to the mortgage payment and subsidize the mortgage payment. And it's an important tool. It's a very important tool because um, it helps very low income people. It's um, Section 8 programs are limited to people making less than 50% of median income. Um, but because they're only paying out 30% of their income, whether it's on rent or with a mortgage, uh, that's, um, you know, you have, you're really addressing affordability in an excellent way. The, um, the other key piece to note here is that 61% of all the voucher holders in the country are Black or Latino. And this is a tremendous population. There's very deep interest in becoming um, a homeowner uh, among people in, in that population. So not everybody wants it, but those that do, we should be able to give them that opportunity. And there are 2.3 million people who are Section 8 voucher holders currently. Less than 10,000 of them are home ownership vouchers. And we need to change that. And uh, there are better ways to do it than the way that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac look at um, the Section 8 uh, underwriting and uh, sort of let me tell you first what the best practice is. The best practice is by what FHA and what um, portfolio lenders do, and that is if the um, if the subsidy payment is paid directly to the lender to the servicer, the uh, they subtract the amount of the subsidy from the principal interest taxes and insurance, the house of and the PITI. Um, they subtract it directly or offset it from the mortgage amount um, that they're qualifying people for. And the remainder, the which is 30% of people's income, is what they actually qualify for on the loan. The practice that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac use is um, that they treat that payment as income. And so they are qualifying people on the entire PITI, principal interest taxes and insurance, um, including not only what what the owner pays, but what the uh, uh, what the subsidy covers, and um, you do plus up the um, value of the income because you're not paying taxes on it, um, so it, it doesn't increase the household income, but it has nearly less of uh, it's hardly as near the impact of if somebody's um, being qualified on just the portion they actually pay. And in today's high price market, this is a critical element. And keep in mind that um, regardless of how you underwrite the loan, the home owner would pay the same amount. So that this is um, uh, this is all about qualification and how can we get more people to be able to qualify for this tremendous valuable tool. Um, it's a great way of addressing uh, underserved populations and critical for uh, uh, their performance, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac's performance in, in the marketplace. We'd also um, like to encourage that when this the adoption of, of offset as the way to approach Section 8 home ownership uh, vouchers, um, um, but also that they be added to the automated underwriting so that there are um, uh, so that it's uh, part of the automatic system rather than manual underwriting, because we do know that there's reluctance to go for the manual methodology and we need to mainstream these loans. There's a tremendous amount of work that we are doing, that HUD is doing, that uh, many groups are doing around the country now to make Section 8 a much more valuable process in the home ownership field, but we need Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to um, be part of all that. And it fits in neatly with what their goals are. Um, I'm just going to mention a couple other quick policy pieces. Um, we 
appreciate a lot that the loan level price adjustments that made borrowing much more expensive for um, basically low down payment borrowers, that there's been some substantial improvements in it. Uh, we do feel strongly that any loan level price adjustments that raise the cost of the mortgage for first um, time home buyers or for um, 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 homeowners who live principally in their own house, um, that that should be um, um, eliminated. Um, One minute. There, um, we do also appreciate the incorporating rent in the um, uh, more automatically in the credit evaluation. That's very important. And on the definition of um, uh, first generation home buyer, we we agree with um, everything that uh, uh, the National Fair Housing Alliance has said. We would add one proviso in that, which is that in the mortgage programs, we have found that first time home buyers and people who would we, we think would be first generation may have, and this is very common in the black community, they may actually have a small slice of ownership in a legacy property. Um, we would often find that uh, families living in the north had um, um, a piece of uh, ownership in, in property in Alabama and North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, um, and southern states. It's all part of the great migration, and um, that's not really the same as owning a house on your own, and we want to preserve that part of the legacy. So I think that's just something that needs a little bit of special attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bruce. So now we have Christy Finzel, and then we will take a break afterwards. Thank you, Christy. Thank you. Um, my name is Christy Fensel. I'm a citizen of the Osage Nation and the executive director of the Oklahoma Native Assets Coalition, ONAC, as it is known as a um, Native-led organization with a 23-year history of providing integrated asset building programming in the United States. And uh, we are a member of the Underserved Mortgage Markets Coalition. It is our understanding that duty to serve does not currently address or cover American Indians and Alaska Natives unless they reside in rural areas. It is important to note that American Indians and Alaska Natives reside in rural and urban areas across the country, and there is documentation of undercounting of both the Native, urban, and rural areas in the 2020 Census. At least 70% of American Indians and Alaska Natives reside in urban areas, and we think this is a conservative and undercounted estimate of the urban Indian population. The GSAs should create or expand their native loan products and other resources to serve native citizens, regardless of where they purchase a home in the US through their equitable housing finance plans, which do not have the same restrictions about serving non-rural native peoples. In our opinion, this country has a duty to reach all of these unserved and underserved tribal citizens, and they should all be covered in these EHF plans. Um, and I guess I'll just also state at this point that um, when we are thinking about addressing native housing solutions, we're trying to think big picture and um, as inclusive as possible. And so we just don't want people um, left out. And um, we also don't want pitting between urban and rural. That just doesn't get us anywhere. So. Um, what we're saying is there's enough resources and there should be enough to go out for everyone. Um, in terms of housing, the urban and rural Indians that ONAP serves are all very underserved and high need populations. And we are trying to provide programming that is serving native citizens nationally, regardless of where they reside. Um, in our own DPA or down payment assistance programming, um, we are um, serving uh, tribal citizens and others that are non-native because of fair housing laws in areas where they wish to purchase a home. So that's urban areas on trust lands, et cetera. Um, ONAC is one of the only native organizations national in scope that is directly providing down payment assistance. As a native nonprofit, we have to figure out how to provide down payment assistance to those we serve, regardless of where they intend to purchase a home. So for example, in a city, in the suburbs, on a reservation, um, and that might be in a very rural, rural area or um, post McGirt versus Oklahoma, that also means the city of Tulsa. So um, we also are serving on tribal trust lands in rural areas um, that are not reservation, et cetera. 
So uh, I think it's important to acknowledge that proportionate to the size of the city, Tulsa still has the highest concentration of tribal citizens residing in a city in the United States, and it is a reservation in a large urban area now. Um, we must also acknowledge that there are tribes putting land into trust that is not only in rural areas. Entities like ONAC need the flexibility and full access to the enterprise resources to allow us to serve all native home buyers. Thus, we suggest that the GSEs work with all in the native housing ecosystem. So that ecosystem is very broad. Um, that includes um, entities like ONAC that are 501c3s that are not CDFIs. That includes native CDFIs. That includes tribally owned banks or financial institutions, so credit unions as well. Um, and all of us that are providing these integrated wraparound asset building programming um, to help those uh, that we serve to be able to purchase a home and build other assets. Um, so um, that also includes the tribally designated housing entities and um, all of our other partners. We would like location neutral American Indian Alaska Native programs. And we'd like for the enterprises to consider funding all those in that ecosystem. So if there are grant programs, for example, we would like for ONAC as a 501c3 that is serving pan-Indian across the United States and is not a nonprofit that is under a tribal government to be able to also apply for the funding. Um, so we, we'd like everyone to be able to, when we layer down payment assistance, it really works with those that we are serving. So we need multiple down payment assistance resources to be able to get people into housing. Um, also, uh, we would, so related to that down payment assistance, we would suggest that a pilot could be um, implemented where there would be funding for native-led nonprofits that are not CDFIs for the housing authorities, for the tribal governments, for the native CDFIs, um, for the tribally owned banks, all to be able to support the down payment assistance piece. It could be similar, for example, to some of the pieces that are working well um, under the federal home loan bank system. We also are in support of capital pool that allows for deep subsidies and improved financing tools for new infrastructure. And basically, we hope that longer term duty to serve will be revised to include all high needs native peoples in rural and urban areas. But until that is done, um, we are requesting that the GSEs think about how to handle this um, through these equitable housing finance plans. And one last note, um, if we would really appreciate if, 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 if FHFA would consider um, reevaluating the definition of what is considered a native entity we're running into this on the federal home loan bank piece, but I think it is applying potentially to maybe how the enterprises might try to put grant funding out. And so we would like a very um, expanded understanding that native nonprofits do not all fall under tribal governments. So you could have an entity like a 501c3 that is serving across the country is not connected to one native nation. And um, for there also to be opportunities for entities uh, such to be able to apply for these uh, funds, um, because otherwise it's really not taking into account the realities in the um, native asset building field or in the housing ecosystem. So we're grateful to the GSEs and uh, FHFA for all their work. We look forward to continued collaboration and we appreciate the opportunity to share today. Thank you. Thanks, Christy. So um, it's 2.58 now. We can, we'll take a 10 minute break and uh, let's just come back at uh, Three, uh, 310 to get started with the next section or the next portion of our listening session. Okay, so we'll go ahead and come off break now that it's 310. And our next speaker is Leslie Gooch from Manufactured Housing Institute, followed by Brian Stromberg from Grounded Solutions Network. Leslie? Thank you so much. Uh, again, my name is Leslie Gooch. I'm the CEO of the Manufactured Housing Institute. We're the national trade group that represents all segments of the manufactured housing industry. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, many of you know that June is National Home Ownership Month, and I've actually just come from the National Mall. Uh, we are preparing for HUD's innovative housing showcase on the mall. We have two manufactured homes on display this year at the showcase. Uh, and we're a co-presenter, which we're really excited about with our partnership with HUD. This is our fourth year 
showing policymakers what quality homes are being produced through our 50 year partnership with HUD. Over the years, we've displayed single section, multi section, cross mod homes, and accessory dwelling units, all built to the federal building code, which means that these homes have been built to rigorous federal standards and they bear the federal seal of approval. This year, we have two duplexes on display. We're excited about the innovations of our home builders as they seek to address the housing needs across the country, including in high density areas. So I hope that um, we see you all out there. We're looking forward um, to a great showcase. I appreciate the opportunity today to comment on the equitable housing plans of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. We believe that manufactured housing is an absolutely critical component of the enterprise's affordable and equitable housing plans. First, we are the nation's most affordable home ownership option by far. Last year, the average cost of a new manufactured home was about $122,000, while the average site-built home was over $412,000, and that excludes the land. The average income for a manufactured home buyer, according to census, was under $51,000, while the average income for a site-built home buyer was over $128,000. So we are attainable home ownership and we're quality home ownership without compromise. We believe that manufactured housing is absolutely critical to the GSEs. Uh, there is a statutory responsibility under duty to serve to develop innovative loan products and serve this very, very important market. Let me start by saying that as important as Fannie and Freddie are for manufactured housing and affordable housing in general, nothing is more important to affordable manufactured housing than resolving our current energy efficiency requirements that are in conflict with the HUD building code, the requirements coming out of the Department of Energy. Because of the DOE's reliance on site-built construction standards, its rules do not consider the fact that our homes are built in a factory and transported to a site. Uh, this uh, way we build results in unique considerations about transportation and delivery, and that's all considered by our federal building code, the HUD code. Unfortunately, though, the Department of Energy has come up with rules that will add at a minimum $5,000 to the average cost of a new manufactured home, and it disrupts the decades of exclusive HUD jurisdiction over manufactured home construction, state safety, and energy standards. We believe there's a better way. This industry has embraced energy efficiency. We're producing the most energy efficiency housing in the country. On the National Mall, we're showcasing our solar shingle and other energy efficiency offerings. Our industry's largest builder is producing net zero energy ready homes. We're an industry on the forefront of energy efficiency, but we need our federal building code to continue to reflect the way we build and deliver homes and not compromise on energy efficiency. HUD has a way to do this because they know us and they understand us. DOE's rule would have the effect of negatively impacting the availability of affordable manufactured homes with nominal at best energy efficiency improvement. We continue to urge Congress to work to restore the exclusive jurisdiction of HUD over these standards. We also urge HUD and the DOE to work together uh, to adopt what the Federal Advisory Committee came up with as the new energy efficiency standards, we completely embrace what the Manufactured Housing Consensus Committee at HUD came up with. The standards provide almost all the energy efficiency benefits of the DOE standards, but they do it without the large and unnecessary cost increases. So second, another issue that we see right now and we wanna comment on, it's the enthusiasm that we're seeing for what are called resident owned communities. About 30% of the homes that are produced today by our manufacturers go into what we call land lease communities. It's a wonderful hybrid home ownership option for people, and our consumer research shows that people love living in these communities. I want to be clear that resident-owned communities have a place in the market, but it's absolutely critical that FHFA and the enterprises not lose sight of the important role that for-profit manufactured home communities have had in affordable housing. My plea here today and to all of Washington is to follow a balanced approach that recognizes the critical role 
of for-profit community operators in preserving communities and home values. There's room uh, for affordable housing across the board, and we should not uh, be preferring one ownership type of communities over another. I do wanna thank Fannie and Freddie for creating programs for cross-mod homes and recently fixing appraisal programs problems with uh, that went along with that original uh, creation. Uh, that was extremely important. We also would urge that Fannie and Freddie expand the cross-mod home program to include single section homes so that we can serve housing mm -hmm. needs in higher density areas. I also want to talk about personal property. Despite the Harris statute asking Fannie and Freddie to consider personal property loans as a part of duty to serve, we don't see that either have made a, a single personal property loan. Um, so we renew our call for Fannie and Freddie to roll up their sleeves, work to develop a flow program to purchase and securitize personal property manufactured homes, which constitutes 70% of the market. I also want to address loan level price adjustments. For real property manufactured homes, Fannie and Freddie charge a 50 basis point LLPA. We do not have any data to analyze whether this fee add-on is justified. We would call on the GSEs to look at their performance data. In closing, MHI and our members appreciate everything that Fannie, Freddie, and FHFA have been doing to support affordable manufactured housing and to elevate it as a, a very important uh, affordable, attainable homeownership option. We look forward to working with you all and other industry players going forward so that we can address the nation's housing shortage going forward. Thank you very much. Thanks, Leslie. And now we have Brian Stromberg from Grounded Solutions Network, followed by Willie Fleming from Chicago Anti-Eviction Campaign. Brian. Thanks, Denise. Uh, my name is Brian Stromberg, and I'm the National Policy Director at Grounded Solutions Network. I want to begin by thanking FHFA for holding these listening sessions. Uh, opportunities to provide public input like this are an important platform for advocates to help FHFA and the enterprises achieve their mission goals. Uh, Grounded Solutions is a national nonprofit membership organization of over 200 organizations, individuals, and allies that support models of shared equity homeownership. Uh, which encompasses several forms of resale restricted housing, which balance wealth building with uh, maintaining affordability. Like many of the other presenters on this call, um, presenting during this listening session, we are a member of the Underserved Mortgage Markets Coalition. The work that Granite Solutions does has a very natural alignment with the work that's being discussed today. Uh, we support housing that creates lasting multi-generational affordability uh, creating stability for households and communities, particularly communities of color. According to the 2022 Census of CLTs and Shared Equity Entities we just published, uh, just under half of all CLT homeowners are people of color, compared to 26% across all homeowners. 98% of survey community land trusts and shared equity organizations have affordability terms of 30 years or more. And our models also support first-time home buyers who comprise 87% of community land trust homeowners. Given all of this, it's not a surprise that Granite Solutions strongly supports the goals of the Equitable Housing Finance Program and appreciates the activities that the enterprises have undertaken up until now. The enterprises work on shared equity homeownership through duty to serve has shown us the impact that they can have when they bring their resources to bear. While the Equitable Housing Program does not include shared equity as a specified activity, which we did advocate for, uh, we still believe that it plays an important role in creating fair, sustainable, and equitable housing opportunity. Incorporating shared equity into the enterprise's equitable housing activities can also bridge the two mission directives and enhance the impact of both. We see several places in the enterprise's plans where shared equity can play a role and increase the impact. My limited time prevents me from going into any detail, but I'm going to run through a short list. Um, beginning with Fannie Mae, uh, and their work on closing the knowledge gap. We see that education on shared equity homeownership is an option for certain households, and we feel it's particularly important for them, uh, for those who fall just below the threshold for traditional mortgage, who would benefit from the stability of a mortgage to be uh, made aware of their opportunities in, that, in shared equity. When it comes to reducing uh, closing costs and Fannie Mae's effort to do so, I will point out that shared equity models provide affordable ownership opportunities that are renewed with each resale including reduced closing costs. 
Uh, regarding their uh, innovation innovation challenge activity, uh, encouraging black ownership uh, through a special purpose credit program in the Twin Cities of Minnesota, we also feel that shared equity should be a part of that conversation and that Fannie Mae can leverage their position as a grantee to do so. The Twin Cities metropolitan area has a particularly robust CLT scene, and we feel that shared equity could provide another option for folks participating in the special purpose credit program. Habitat for Humanity, which is uh, the major partner doing this initiative with Fannie Mae, is no stranger to shared equity, and they have their own internal expertise that could be drawn on. Uh, moving to Freddie, uh, who helpfully numbered um, their items in their plan, uh, the item 4.1, their down payment assistance tool. Uh, we feel that down payment assistance is an important tool for creating affordable home ownership opportunities. And we also feel that combining that with shared equity ownership models can ensure that the benefits of down payment assistance touch as many households as possible. Activity 4.5, uh, improving the quality of single family homes in traditional underserved Black and Latino communities. Uh, in this item, Freddie proposes the use of new markets tax credits to grow the supply of quality single family homes through renovation and redevelopment of vacant property. Bringing shared equity into any conversations that Freddie is having with local vacant property stewards can help to place those vacant properties into the hands of a committed stewardship organization. And we are more than happy to make recommendations. Item 5.9 from Freddie's Equitable Housing Plan update. Preserving at-risk affordable housing through loan products. We definitely share Freddie Mac's concerns regarding the expiration of light tech affordability provisions. Uh, we would gently suggest one potential approach that could be explored is converting light tech developments to limited equity cooperatives, which is a form of shared equity ownership uh, that we promote. So moving from the individual GSEs to opportunities that we see across both enterprises' plans. I'm happy to see Lita on the call here because I'm going to mention social bonds, which are also mentioned by both Freddie and Fannie. Uh, Granted Solutions provided a comment letter in response to the RFI published by FHFA on social bonds, where we outlined a suggestion to use such a bond's proceeds to create and preserve affordable owner-occupied homes for lower-income households, especially households of color, through a homeownership trust fund. We would encourage FHFA and the enterprises to consider this as they go forward with the social bond implementation. A second opportunity across both enterprises uh, for integrating GIA, uh, excuse me, integrating shared equity is uh, in their outreach and education efforts. Shared equity homeownership provides a very solid foundation for households to enter into traditional ownership. Um, and both enterprises have already established products that support uh, various forms of shared equity ownership. Finally, uh, both enterprises are exploring the potential of special purpose credit programs. Fannie Mae specifically states that community land trust properties are eligible for loans through their Home Ready First program. One minute. And we hope that any outreach or education mentions this. We have members in many of the metropolitan areas where Home Ready is active. And we also ask that any similar program created by Freddie specify that CLT properties are eligible. Like our fellow UMMC members, the Understood Mortgage Market Coalition, we see the final rule. Uh, that was recently published as a major step forward in addressing issues of equity in the housing finance system. We urge FHFA to take additional steps to increase transparency and accountability, such as plan development guidelines, publicly disclosed evaluation system with ratings, and the requirement to comprehensively report on impact and outcomes. Wrapping up, I'd like to thank FHFA again for providing this venue for feedback and input, and to thank the enterprises for continuing this important work. We see a strong overlap between the mission of Granite Solutions Network and the goals described in the Equitable Housing Finance Program. We hope we can expand our partnership with the enterprises beyond duty to serve to grow the presence of shared equity ownership throughout the affordable housing landscape. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. And now we have Willie Fleming from the Chicago Anti-Conviction Cam Eviction Campaign followed by uh, Josh Silver from National Community Reinvestment Coalition. Willie? First, first of all, I wanted to thank FHFA for this opportunity um, to speak today about equitable housing finance. My name is Willie J.R. Fleming. I am a community buyer. First of all, my name is Willie J.R. Fleming. I'm the executive director of the Chicago Anti-Eviction Campaign. I'm also president of Chicago Owners Land Trust. Our organization is a community bar with Fannie Mae Community First Program, 
and NCST Neighborhood Stabilization Initiative. As community buyers, we have had the opportunity over the last five years to provide equitable housing to both uh, the affordable market rate and low income market. Today, we are encouraging Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac FHFA to create a program that increased closing costs to assist home buyers. We're also, uh, also requesting that F FHFA also create a special program and housing plan that deals directly for community land trust. When we talk of equity, we say, what is equitable? We believe that our government should have balanced investment for, for for profits and nonprofits, balanced investment in market rate home ownership programs, balanced investment in community land trust models, cooperative housing models, and shared and limited equity housing models. Getting creative and working with community buyers to increase acquisition opportunity means that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac must get creative in the financing model they put forth. We believe this is this includes but is not limited to creating a line of credit for community buyers to purchase Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac property, creating more discounted and donated properties for community buyers, encouraging public and private partnership between community buyers, investors, and the public housing authorities and CDFIs. Again, my name is Willie J.R. Fleming. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. Thank you, Willie. And now we have Josh Silver followed by Heidi Welch from Minnesota Housing. Josh. Good, good afternoon. The National Community Reinvestment Coalition okay. appreciates this opportunity to comment on the equitable housing finance plan requirement for the government sponsored enterprises. In order to promote fair lending goals and equitable access to people of color and underserved communities, the GFDs must be subjected to fair lending regulations that are as strenuous as those imposed on primary market lenders. However, over the years, the fair lending oversight of the GSEs seem to have been opaque. The FHFA's equitable housing finance plan requirement has the potential to increase the transparency and accountability of the GSEs in serving people of color and traditionally underserved communities. The key, however, is whether the equitable housing finance plans are rigorous. The plans represent a start, but need to be enhanced by adding more precise performance measures and clear opportunities for public input in their formation. The equitable housing plans have the potential to increase partnerships among the GSEs, community-based nonprofit organizations, and banks. In the absence of the equitable plan requirements, it is likely there would be fewer partnerships like the ones described in the GSE plan updates. However, more information on selection criteria for establishing partnerships would help community groups work with the GSEs to target underserved communities. A barrier that Fannie Mae chose to address in its equitable housing plan was reliance and credit history reporting and underwriting loans. In response, Fannie Mae has provided subsidies to the owners of multifamily housing to report positive rental payment to the credit bureaus. Under this effort, 117,000 borrowers were assisted, but the pilot program will end in 2024. Fannie Mae should report on the success of the program, such as whether it resulted in loan approvals for applicants that may have otherwise been re rejected due to a lack of traditional credit history. More information about the degree of success would enable community groups to offer specific recommendations about whether this effort should be renewed and how it can be improved. Another strategy used to address barriers to credit for underserved communities is the use of special purpose credit programs, SPCP. Lenders and GSEs have designed SPCPs to serve traditionally underserved populations in communities identified through data analysis. SPCPs are also eligible for Community Reinvestment Act credit in the 2023 final CRA rule. Each GSE now finances about 10,000 SPCP loans annually, but it's hard to discern from the updates to the equitable housing plans whether this figure represents an increase from past years. It is also unclear whether the SPCP loan volume will increase the number or percentage of home purchase loans for people of color nationally or in certain geographical areas. Thus, to make the reporting in the equitable plans more meaningful, the GSE should report a few key indicators about the SPCP activity. Firstly, they should document how their SPCP loan purchases compare with previous years. Secondly, they should estimate whether their annual SPC purchases will make a difference in increasing access to credit for underserved borrowers at state, metropolitan, or county levels. 
Thirdly, they should report on whether they are working with banks to focus on specific metropolitan areas or rural counties. When the FHFA proposed regulations for the housing equitable plans last year, it implied that national level analysis alone would be insufficient in ensuring that local and underserved areas were priorities for the GSEs and their equitable housing finance plans. Under the affordable housing goals, a GSE could theoretically meet its national goals by focusing on areas in the country in which it is easiest to purchase loans made to low and moderate income borrowers and or in underserved communities and communities of color. This would not improve the distribution of capital and mortgage credit throughout the nation across a plethora of metropolitan areas, rural areas, and underserved areas. To rectify this, NCRC proposes that the FHFA add local evaluations to its equitable planning processes. The FHFA would identify the following distinct groups of metropolitan areas and rural counties. Areas in which the GSEs and the primary market both perform well in reference to demographic benchmarks. This could be measured as the percentage of loans being similar to the percentage of households that are low and moderate income or people of color. Areas in which both GSEs or one GSE outperform the primary market. This could be measured by the percent of loans that GSEs purchase that are made to people of color or modest income borrowers being higher than the percent of loans lenders make to these populations. Areas in which the primary market outperforms Fannie Mae or, or Freddie Mac in serving traditionally underserved populations. And lastly, underserved areas in which both the primary market and the GSEs are underperforming and that the share of loans are lowest compared to the percentage of low and moderate income or people of color. Responding to the FHFA evaluation of local performance, the equitable housing plans would require the GSEs to describe how they will maintain performance in the areas in which they do well. The equitable plans would then require the GSEs to focus in the areas in which they are being outperformed by their counterpart and or the primary market. The plans would also address areas where neither the primary nor secondary market is performing well. The GSEs can describe underwriting reforms, pro product changes, development of new partnerships, and new marketing approaches that would help them improve performance in their areas where they are lagging. The FHFA could decide what is the minimal progress required for the GSEs to meet or exceed the goals on their equitable housing finance plans. For example, the FHFA could require that by the end of the three years in the equitable housing plan, the GSEs must measurably decrease disparities between the share of loans lenders issued to low and moderate income borrowers and the share of loans they purchase made to these borrowers in at least one third of the areas in which the GSEs were underperforming. At the very least, performance in the localities group, at the very least, performance in the localities grouped by the above categories should be displayed on an FHFA website in color-coded maps as well as numerically in FHA, FHFA tables at the beginning and end of the housing finance plan terms. In this manner, the general public and local stakeholders have an improved ability to hold the GSEs accountable and approach them for partnership opportunities in geographical areas where they lag the primary market and in underserved areas where both the primary and secondary market are financing a low level of loans compared to demographics. I have uh, recommendations regarding public input that is described more fully in my written testimony. But let me just say that the GSEs are required to engage stakeholders and community organizations in the development of the plans. I did not see any announcements on the GSC websites about these opportunities. I think that the GSC should hold uh, meetings, at least, virtual meetings at least three, at least three times over the year, once when they are when they are just thinking about their plans, once when they have drafted when they have drafted plans and to get community input, and finally when they have finalized the plan and explained their choices to the community. And also, I think the FHFA should also hold a hearing like this one at the beginning of the year. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Josh. And I will now pass it to Heidi, uh, followed by Grace White from National Tenant Union Federation. Heidi. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Heidi Welts. I'm with Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. And um, I would like to start by just saying thank you. Thank you to the FHFA and to the GSEs for their work and also for this discussion. Um, at Minnesota Housing, we also echo the need for 
some type of national construction programs and support. Um, I think across the country, that is one of the things that is very much needed is entry level uh, homes and just something that we really need to, to think about and provide support for. Um, we also are echoing the need for some solutions, lending solutions on tribal trust land properties and um, also for better options and or new ideas for manufactured housing. Um, what I really wanted to speak about uh, today is the definition of the first generation home buyer that was recently released by the GSEs. Minnesota Housing feels that the definition released um, is the mortgage revenue bond definition and not actually a true first time or first generation home buyer definition. We feel that the definition is too broad and that using it will not have the restorative just, justice that was intended by first generation home buyer programs because using it will include many individuals who are not commonly understood to be first generation home buyers. Minnesota Housing would like to see an alternative definition that speaks to actual home ownership ever, not just in the last three years. And that it also includes not only the borrowers, but the next level of generation, so parents and or guardians, and also allows for those who may have lost their home due to foreclosure. Adding parameters like these will allow us to serve those who have been historically underserved, discriminated against, and unable to build generational wealth. One last point is that if until any change of the current GSE first generation definition occurs, Minnesota Housing also echoes the ask that the GSEs do make it very clear that HFAs can use their own definition and that if lenders are using the HFA definition, that the lenders should then follow that definition. Thank you again for the opportunity. It's very much appreciated. Thank you, Heidi. And now we have Grace White, um, followed by, sorry, um, Ellie Pepper from National Housing Resource Center. Grace? Thanks so much. My name is Grace, and I'm an organizer with the National Tenant Union Federation. The Federation is a union of unions, the first national organization of its kind to establish tenants as a political class that cannot be ignored. We will officially launch this summer. For two years, tenants organized through the Federation have engaged with the FHFA to expand accessible, affordable, and sustainable housing opportunities for tenants. Last year, our members knocked over 15,000 doors across 57 enterprise-backed properties, and we supported tenants and their allies in submitting 2,374 comments to the Tenant Protections RFI. We've worked closely with lawyers, policy experts, and economists to conduct extensive research on the impacts of enterprise-backed lending at the neighborhood, city, and federal levels. Today, we'll focus on the current market conditions and whether or not the equitable housing finance plans effectively prioritize changes to increase accessible and affordable housing opportunities. Today's rental market is more consolidated than ever before. Landlords are using price setting algorithms to artificially inflate rents. Between 2019 and 2023, landlords hiked rents an average of 30.4% nationwide. In 2023, there is not a single state, metro, or county where a worker employed full-time at the federal minimum wage can afford a modest two-bedroom apartment. In fact, to afford a two-bedroom apartment, a minimum wage worker would need to work four jobs or have three roommates. Rent hikes disproportionately impact black and brown tenants, tenants with disabilities, and poor tenants. In 2020, 56% of Black tenants and 54% of Latino tenants were cost burden, compared to 45% of white tenants. Frequent and aggressive rent hikes are the single biggest barrier to accessing and keeping affordable rental housing. 
Fannie and Freddie's voluntary rent restrictions programs will not adequately address this crisis that tenants face. Each program aims to preserve affordability for a few thousand units. During the pandemic, landlords converted affordable units to market rate housing, and that segment of the market lost 1.2 million units between 2019 and 2021 alone. In this same period of time, 14 states lost more than 15% of their affordable housing stock. This is not a story of underproduction. This is a story of deregulation. These units were not demolished. Landlords increased the rent. The most impactful action that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac can take to preserve and expand access to affordable housing in 2025 and beyond is regulating rent hikes as a condition of enterprise-backed financing. These regulations would protect um, and preserve affordability in millions of units. Without universal rent regulations, the enterprises are enabling landlords whose business models rely on frequent, aggressive, and predatory rent hikes. I'm gonna pass it over to Harvey Nash, a former tenant of an enterprise-backed property to speak to the impact of rent hikes. Thank you, Grace. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Harvey Nash. Um, I'm a tenant in Kansas City, Missouri. Last summer, I was living in the Willow Creek Apartments. Fannie Mae back $58.8 million uh, loan for Landmark to purchase the property. Landmark squeezed me for everything I had. They hiked my rent every year that I was there. After the bills were paid, there was nothing left. Landmark's business is a risky one, but Landmark got to make the choice about the risk. Their lender got to make a choice about the risk. The only party that didn't get a chance to make a, um, a choice in the matter was me, the tenant. For Landmark, at worst, a risky investment means defaulting on the loan. The rent got too damn high. I lost my home in October. Now I'm homeless. I slept in my ride for a month. I was so caught up in what I was going through that I forgot my daughter's birthday on November 3rd. Now I'm at her place crashing on the air mattress. I'm 66 years old. I worked my whole life for corporations, for myself, uh, for schools, you name it. I've just about done it. I just need to tell you clearly, it's all about the rent. If these plans don't include rent regulation, you're doing nothing meaningful to increase affordable housing for tenants. And uh, thank you. You're muted, Denise. Thank you. Thank you. I was saying thank you, Grace, and thank you for having that additional speaker to let us know um, what's going on firsthand from that firsthand experience. Um, now we have Ellie Pepper, uh, followed by Erica Young from Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. Ellie? Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ellie Pepper, and I am the Deputy Director at the National Housing Resource Center. NHRC is a national nonprofit that advocates for and on behalf of HUD approved housing counseling agencies and the clients they serve. I appreciate this opportunity today to comment on the enterprise's equitable housing finance plans. I'd like to start by commenting on Fannie Mae's home view online home buyer education. While I see some positive changes to the curriculum and the online program, it continues to fall short overall. For example, in the first module, there is a roadmap graphic outlining the home buying process. The final step on this roadmap is to get pre-qualified. I should say the first step on this roadmap is to get pre-qualified. And the second step is to connect with the real estate agent. However, meeting with a housing counselor is not mentioned on this roadmap. There is small print under the roadmap encouraging those who need help to contact a HUD approved housing counseling agency. But housing counseling should be the first step on that roadmap, especially 
for first time and first generation home buyers. Additionally, the National Association of Realtors settlement impacting how commissions are paid is causing a lot of confusion. Buyer agents are essential members of the home buying team, but they earn income from commissions. Housing counselors can help home buyers understand the process of negotiating a contract with a buyer agent so that the terms are in the home buyer's best interest. The housing counselor's only goal is to ensure the home buyer gets the best possible deal. They have no skin in the game, they don't get a commission. Sometimes this advice means telling the consumer that they just aren't ready to buy. Speaking of the importance of housing counseling in the home buying process, we thank Fannie Mae for including a $500 LLPA credit when a home ready purchaser uses housing counseling. Unfortunately, most housing agencies never see this credit, which we believe is intended to pay for the counseling. Instead, originators are taking the credit and putting it into their loan pricing. At a time when HUD Office of Housing Counseling continues to experience budget cuts, even though housing counseling is becoming increasingly important, housing counseling agencies need all the support they can get for the amazing work they do. Regarding the Freddie Mac Equitable Housing Plan, we are excited about the down payment assistance tool and pleased that housing counseling agencies are being invited to be part of and use the resource. We applaud the efforts of the Mission Servicing Oversight Framework to ensure homeowners get information about loss mitigation options as early as possible when becoming delinquent. It seems the intent is to offer assistance to delinquent borrowers through HUD approved housing counseling agencies. We hope this continues and grows since consumers are very wary of their servicer, especially, especially when they are delinquent. This is true no matter how nice or knowledgeable the servicing rep is because the servicer ultimately can take their home. Homeowners are nervous about what they say and about talking frankly regarding their finances. Concerning the affordable housing targets, while showing improvement in the past five years, neither of the enterprises serve Black and Hispanic Latino homebuyers at the same level as white homebuyers. The population of Black consumers in the U.S. is roughly 13%, 19% Hispanic Latino, and 60% white. Yet both enterprises average around 7% for Black homeowners, 15% for Hispanic Latino homebuyers, while it is 66% for white home buyers. Again, while these numbers represent an improvement from 2020, we believe it can and should be at least in line with the actual percentage of the racial breakdown in the US. Both enterprise plans include efforts to conduct outreach, especially for the special purpose credit programs. Done right, these programs could potentially be one tool to address the racial homeownership gap and allowing more consumers of color to gain access to affordable home ownership. I do want to emphasize done right. These could potentially be a tool. We would be interested in helping the under the enterprises conduct effective outreach, outreach partnering with housing counseling agencies in target markets. NHRC has demonstrated su success reaching Black and Hispanic Latino consumers with in-person and virtual events done in partnership with housing counseling agencies. Being local to the communities that they serve, housing counselors are a trusted resource and can reach consumers that are harder for lenders to connect with. And again, I thank you for the opportunity to comment today. Thanks, Ellie. So now we have our last speaker, Erica Young from the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. Erica? Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, great, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, so Erica Young, I'm from the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy. Um, we're a 75 year old uh, foundation and we are the convener of the Underserved Mortgage Market Coalition, which coordinates 36 major affordable housing organizations for more equitable access to home financing. And I wanted to raise a few issues related to the equitable housing finance plan. So thank you very much for this opportunity. 
We think that the EHF rule is a major step forward in addressing issues of equity in the housing finance system, particularly for people of color and others chronically underserved by the mortgage market. The FHFA final EHF rule includes some key improvements over the proposed rule, including the requirement that FHFA publish a narrative evaluation of each government-sponsored enterprise plan performance. This information provides an opportunity for the public to learn of plan successes in areas for continued um, attention, which the rule, as it was initially proposed, lacked. The coalition, however, urges FHFA to take additional steps to further strengthen the program and build on the new rule by increasing transparency and accountability. For example, the rule and its implementing guidance should include a plan development guidelines, a publicly disclosed evaluation system with actual ratings, and a requirement to report performance on each objective in each plan. The UMMC also advocates and Lincoln also advocate for language preference collection to occur as a part of the mortgage servicing process, not just when loans are made. Lincoln continues to advocate that the enterprises emphasize their commitment to leveraging their industry leadership positions to promote climate resilience, property, climate resiliency and property improvements by identifying and developing resilience criteria. Given evidence of racial disparities that exist related to physical climate risk, we recommend that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac create financial tools that empower nonprofits and mission-driven developers to increase renovation and redevelopment activity in historic, historically Black and Latino communities. We also recommend that the enterprises develop improved financial tools to support Native communities needing to relocate due to climate change. These tools should be accessible both on and off trust land with special attention paid to usability in Alaska Native villages and localities. And we also want to address at Lincoln the heirs property issue. Uh, it's a critical step in addressing the wealth gap. The Urban Institute estimates that 28 billion in wealth is held in limbo in the American South alone. And the issue is not just exclusive to Southern and or rural areas, but cities like Baltimore, Detroit, and others that grapple with blighted properties that result from tangled titles, the expense of probate, and the high level of minority households without wills. While often seen as an issue among Black Americans, the U.S. Forest Service highlights this problem of heirs property is also high among Native Americans, whites in Appalachia, and Hispanics in the Colonias region along the southern border. The National Consumer Law Center states that over 77% of Black households do not have a will, while Consumer Reports cites that 82% of Hispanics also do not have wills. Heirs' property implications limit the ability of owners to access help to address foreclosure prevention, disaster relief assistance, and other supports that ensure long-term stability for households and communities. And while, the, while Lincoln applauds the, UM, applauds the enterprise's shift to understand the scope and effect of heirs' property, there is an urgent need to stem the increase in problem. The, Lincoln Institute recommends that FHFA requires the enterprises to include in their plans developing and implementing a pilot to include a state planning education in their home ownership education programs and develop and implement a pilot for state planning education following post purchase home ownership counseling in collaboration with counseling and legal services. The pilot should include three to five markets with high rates of heirs property, preferably a mix of rural and urban communities. Thank you once again for the opportunity to present um, the views of the Lincoln Institute. And thank you, for, uh, thank you for this opportunity. And I apologize for the background noise. No, thank you, Erica. Multitasking, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> And so um, with that, it concludes the, our 2024 Equitable Housing Finance Plan listening session. Um, just as a quick reminder and plug um, to, for those who haven't already contributed to our request for information on the plans, it's open until Friday. So please feel free to um, 
provide a comment if you haven't already done so. And then um, again, I wanna thank all our speakers, all our listeners for your valuable contributions and your time during this listening session. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you.